My way is in the sand, flowing between the shingle and the dune. The summer rain rains on my life, on me, my life, harrying, fleeing to its beginning, to its end. Samuel Beckett is the third of the three great masters who made the literary world look to Ireland for its models. In some ways, he is the most unusual, for unlike W.B. Yeats and James Joyce, he has declined to celebrate or affirm anything in human life. He will admit to only four certainties, that he has been born, is living, will die, and for reasons unknown and unknowable, cannot keep silence. Who may tell the tale of the old man? The Beckett hero is usually well on in years. As his passions and appetites flag, he tells himself and others inconclusive stories, asks useless questions, performs useless gestures. Out of an embarrassment of distress, a strange world of farce and tragedy is created. Beckett's characters manage somehow to be funny even as their eyes grow wet with tears. A voice comes to one in the dark. Imagine to one on his back in the dark. My memories begin on the eve of my birth, under the table, when my father gave a dinner party and my mother presided. You were born on an Easter Friday after long labor. Yes, I remember. You first saw the light and cried at the close of the day when in darkness Christ at the ninth hour cried and died. <laughs> Samuel Beckett was born on Good Friday, April the 13th, 1906. You first saw the light in the room you most likely were conceived in. The big bow window looked west to the mountains, mainly west. For being bow, it looked also a little south and a little north, necessarily. A little south to Moor Mountain and a little north to Foothill and Plain. The Beckett family lived in the well-heeled suburb of Fox Rock, at the foot of the Dublin Mountains, close to the Leopardstown Racecourse. Beckett's father, a quantity surveyor, built his large and impressive house. William Beckett was good at sports, and so was his son Samuel. They loved to watch, as well as to participate in them. Between father and son, there grew up an easy affection. Beckett's mother was more complicated. A lover of animals, she kept a donkey and several dogs in the family grounds of Cooldryna. She was both affectionate 
and severe to her younger son, and his struggles to connect with her would later occasionally obtrude into his writings. Samuel Barclay Beckett was the second son, born at home not long after the family had moved into Kuldryna. His elder brother Frank Edward had been born four years earlier in 1902. May Beckett was a devout Protestant. Every Sunday she walked with her sons to the church of Tullow, where the family had a pew. The fairy tales of Mead ended. So say your prayers now and go to bed. Your prayers before the lamps start to sing behind the larches. Here at these knees of stone. Then to bye-bye on the bone. In the end, in the end, you will utter again. Yes, I remember. That was I. That was I then. You are alone in the garden. Your mother is in the kitchen making ready for afternoon tea with Mrs. Coote, making the way for thin bread and butter. From behind a bush, you watch Mrs. Coote arrive, a small, thin, sour woman. Your mother answers her, saying, he is playing in the garden. You climb to near the top of a great fir. You sit a little, listening to all the sounds, Then throw yourself off. The great boughs break your fall. The needles. You lie a little with your face to the ground. Then climb the tree again. Your mother answers Mrs. Coote again, saying, He has been a very naughty boy. William Beckett encouraged his sons to swim, to play rugby, cricket and tennis, to tackle the most demanding mountain walks and to throw themselves without fear into all athletic contests. You stand at the tip of the high board, high above the sea. In it, your father's upturned face, upturned to you. You look down to the loved, trusted face. He calls to you to jump. He calls, be a brave boy. The red, round face, the thick moustache, the graying hair, the swell sways it under and sways it up again. The far call again, be a brave boy. Many eyes upon you, from the water and from the bathing place. Both boys were sent to Portora Royal School in Inniskillen in Northern Ireland, where half a century before they had been preceded by another famous pupil, Oscar Wilde. Young Samuel gave much of his attention to sport. Notwithstanding his slender build, he played scrum half at rugby. A classmate described him as half blind, but brave as a lion about the scrum. He was less notable in his studies, even French, at which he would later show an unexampled proficiency. But he could not help writing his English essays well, though he said he was always second to his friend Geoffrey Thompson's first. 
They also gave me the lowdown on God. They told me I depended on him in the last analysis. They had it on the reliable authority of his agents at Bally, I forget what, this being the place, according to them, where the inestimable gift of life had been rammed down my gullet. They gave me courses on love, on intelligence, most precious, most precious. They also taught me to count and even to reason. Some of this rubbish has come in handy on occasions, I don't deny it, on occasions which would never have arisen if they had left me in peace. I use it still to scratch my ass with. When, like many Portora boys, Beckett went on to Trinity College, Dublin, his literary enthusiasms made scholastic excellence unavoidable. He studied Italian with Walter Starkey and French with Thomas Rudmose Brown, becoming a devotee of Dante with the one and of Baudelaire with the other. He played the piano, cultivating a lasting interest in music, Schubert being among his favorites. At Trinity, Beckett won a gold medal for scholarship and his colors on the university cricket team. After graduation, he knew that quantity surveying was not for him. He tried school teaching, but soon gave it up. He could not bear to teach others what he did not know himself. He chose instead to become a poet. It was, he said, the last ditch for an unemployable man. From childhood, Beckett accompanied his father on 10 or 20 mile walks across the hills overlooking Fox Rock. Here they would wander through mountain and moorland until the fall of night. Das Wandern ist des Mühles und das Wandern. Das Wandern ist des Mühles und das Wandern. Das muss ein schlechter Mühle sein, die ihm niemals fiel. Das Wandern ein, das Wandern, das Wandern, das Wandern, das Wandern. No, they are no more than hills. They raise themselves gently, faintly blue, out of the confused plain. It was there, somewhere, he was born, in a fine house of loving parents. Their slopes are covered with ling and furs, its hot yellow bells, better known as gorse. The hammers of the stone cutters ring all day like bells. A road still carriageable climbs over the high moorland. It cuts across vast turf bogs a thousand feet above sea level, two thousand if you prefer. It leads to nothing anymore. None ever pass this way but beauty spot hogs and fanatical trampers. Under its heather mask, the quag allures, with an allurement not all mortals can resist. Then it swallows them up, or the mist comes down. It is here one would lie down, in a hollow bedded with dry heather, and fall asleep for the last time on an afternoon in the sun, head down among the minute life of stems and bells, and fast fall asleep, 
fast farewell to charming things. Much of Beckett's early work was in verse. Doubtless he had his experiences of youthful love, and he had something of the romantic's feeling for nature. But his early motivation to write came not from these, but from pain. Exhale in a spasm, tired of my darling's red sputum, from the Portobello private nursing home. It's secret things, and toil to the crest of the surge of the steep, perilous bridge, and lapse down blankly under the scream of the hoarding, round the bright, stiff banner of the hoarding, into a black west, throttled with clouds. Above the mansions, the algum trees, the mountains, my skull, sullenly, clot of anger, skewered aloft, strangled in the kang of the wind, bites like a dog against its chastisement. The sport of kings is our passion, the dogs too. We have no political opinions, simply, limply, republican. But we also have a soft spot for the Windsors, the Hanoverians, I forget, the Hohenzollerns, is it? Nothing human is foreign to us once we have digested the racing news. Besides poems, Beckett wrote stories, bizarre stories, in which a hero, someone like Beckett himself, tries ineffectually to come to terms with the social world. When they were published in 1934, under the astonishing title, More Pricks Than Kicks, the book was banned in Ireland. To his consternation, Beckett found that he now had a number, 465, on the censorship lists. He was dismayed and embittered to find himself suffering under so parochial an authority. Perhaps that also is the fault of my mood and my chronic inability to understand a phrase like the Irish people or to imagine that it ever gave a fart in its corduroys for any form of art whatsoever, whether before the Union or after. You wouldn't have something for the ladies' plate, sir. I was given Flash Harry. Flash Harry? That cat horse! In June 1933, his father died suddenly of a heart attack. Desolate with grief, his son asked, what am I to do now but follow his trace over the fields and hedges? Redeem the surrogate goodbyes, the sheet a stream in your hand, who have no more for the land, and the glass unmisted above your eyes. As would happen several times later in his life, disaster spurred him on. More than half of his early published verse dates from the aftermath of his father's death. Saying again, if you do not teach me, I shall not learn. Saying again, there is a last, even of last times, 
Last times of begging, last times of loving, of knowing, not knowing, pretending. A last, even of last times of saying, if you do not love me, I shall not be loved. If I do not love you, I shall not love. As a young man, Beckett travelled in France and Germany. He then lived for a time in London, but eventually he returned to Dublin. The sun shone, having no alternative, on the nothing new. Murphy sat out of it as though he were free in a mew in West Brompton. Out of his years of wandering grew a first novel, which he entitled after the most common of Irish names, Murphy. The first of those Beckett characters who appear to live on the edge of non-being. He is trying to extricate himself from this world and has got pretty far. His vote was cast. I am not of the big world, I am of the little world. We meet him first as he rocks himself in his armchair. Beckett spent some time writing in the attic of the quantity surveyor's office at 6 Clare Street. This may well be the haven to which Murphy retreats from the world he despises. But the garret that he now saw was not an attic, nor yet a mansard, but a genuine garret, not half, but twice as good as the one in Hanover, because half as large. The ceiling and the outer wall were one, a superb surge of white, pitched at the perfect angle of farthest trajectory. Pierced by a small frosted skylight, ideal for closing against the sun by day and opening by night to the stars. Murphy's attempts to seek unreality are abortive, for having forgotten an unlit gas jet, he expires. His will specifies the disposition of his body in a way that crystallizes his contempt for local institutions. With regard to the disposal of these my body, mind and soul, I desire that they be burnt and placed in a paper bag and brought to the Abbey Theatre, Lower Abbey Street, Dublin, and without pause into what the great and good Lord Chesterfield calls the necessary house, where their happiest hours have been spent, on the right as one goes down into the pit, and I desire that the chain be there pulled upon them, if possible during the performance of a piece the whole to be executed without ceremony or show of grief. But the instructions are forgotten. The bearer of the ashes throws them at someone in a pub and they disperse all over the floor. So even Murphy's effort to use his death for purposes of mockery miscarries. By closing time, the body, mind and soul of Murphy were freely distributed over the floor of the saloon and before another day spring grey and the earth had been swept away with the sand, the beer, the butts, the glass, the matches, the spits, the vomit. In his writings, the voice he hears has an Irish inflection. Many of Beckett's characters have unmistakably Irish names. Murphy, Moran, Malloy, the Roonies and the Lynches. Yet their dilemmas transcend national boundaries. As one of them says, tears and laughter, they are so much Gaelic to me. Beckett knew, however, 
that he would have to find his audience and his way of life outside Ireland. Yet Irish he remained, in his sensory history, in his family ties. Asked later if he was English, Beckett replied simply, Au contraire. I have changed refuge so often in the course of my route that now I can't tell between dens and ruins. But there was never any city but the one. It is true, you often move along in a dream. Houses and factories darken the air, trams go by, and under your feet, wet from the grass, there are suddenly cobbles. I only know the city of my childhood. I must have seen the other, but unbelieving. Beckett's life was altered in 1928 when his old professor at Trinity, Rudmose Brown, recommended him as lecturer for two years at the École Normale Supérieure in Paris. The plan, which of course miscarried, was for him to write a thesis as well as teach and eventually return to a position as lecturer at Trinity. For Beckett, going to Paris was like coming home. Paris received its bohemian foreigners benignly and provided them with a literary and artistic scene unrivaled in its ferment. In his early period in Paris, Beckett was captivated by the disconnected imagery of the Surrealists. He translated poems by Breton, Elouard and Crevel. He neglected his thesis to study Descartes. On hearing that Nancy Cunard, a wealthy English woman living in the Rue Guénégaud, was offering a prize of 1,000 francs for the best work on a theme of time, Beckett composed a satirical picture of the life of Descartes and submitted it under the title Horoscope. He won the prize and the poem was published. From poetry, Beckett turned to write two important essays. The first insisted that in Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, form and content were indivisible. The second praised Proust for refusing to yield to what Beckett considered to be the distortions of intelligibility, of cause and effect, of reason. Both essays prepared the way for his own practice. His experience of bereavement in Dublin helped him to compose a small volume of verse. By the time he published Echo's Bones in 1935, he was almost 30, yet unrecognized as a writer except among a few friends and colleagues. In 1938, this obscure talent was almost lost. On the 11th of January, the Irish Times carried a headline telling how an Irish poet had been stabbed on the previous day in Paris. As Beckett was walking around the corner of the Villa Cour de Vey, a local pimp approached and asked him for money. On Beckett's refusal, the man stabbed him in the chest. Fortunately, the knife had missed the vital organs and Beckett recovered in hospital. While he was there, he received a visit from a woman whom he had previously met. Her name was Suzanne de Cheveux du Minil. The occasion proved to be a momentous one. He would share her life and later marry her. Beckett happily formed a friendship with another Irish lecturer at the École Normale, Thomas McGreevy, later to be director of the National Gallery of Ireland. Though McGreevy was devout and Beckett anything but, the two men greatly enjoyed each other's company. Through McGreevy, Beckett was introduced to James Joyce, and Joyce, though cherry of compliments, thought that Beckett had talent. They saw each other often during the decade that followed, their conversations consisted often of silences directed towards each other. Both suffused with sadness. Beckett mostly for the world. Joyce mostly for himself. Their literary paths slowly diverged. 
as it became clear that Finnegan's wake sought to put everything in, while Beckett's work sought to take everything out. A favourite rendezvous was the Pont de Grenelle, from which they would walk together along the Isle of Swans. In a last attempt to obtain relief, he moved from where they had been so long together to a single room on the far bank. From its single window, he could see the downstream extremity of the Isle of Swans. Day after day, he could be seen slowly pacing the islet, hour after hour, in his long black coat, no matter what the weather, and old world Latin quarter hat. At the tip, he would always pause to dwell on the receding stream. How in joyous eddies its two arms conflowed and flowed united on. Then turn and his slow steps retrace. With never a word exchanged, they grew to be as one. Musical evenings, Joyce's son George sang Schubert's and D. Musik while Beckett accompanied him on the piano. Neither Beckett nor the Joyces were to have many more such evenings. Events in Europe were disquieting. Beckett made a trip back to Ireland to see his family now living in Greystones. On Sunday the 3rd of September 1939, he and his brother Frank walked over to the Grand Hotel to listen to the radio. Like the rest of the world, they were shocked to hear Neville Chamberlain grimly announce on the BBC. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. Beckett had to decide whether to stay in neutral Ireland or return to beleaguered France. He preferred France at war to Ireland in peace. In a way, this decision might be said to have brought his youth to an end. Back down to the wharf with the night bag and the old green great coat your father left you trailing the ground and the white hair pouring out down from under the hat Till that time came on down, neither right nor left, not a curse for the old scenes, the old names, not a thought in your head, only get back on board and away to hell out of it and never come back. Or was that another time, all that? another time was there ever any other time but that time a way to hell out of it all and never come back
Within a year, Paris was occupied by the German army. Beckett was horrified at the murders of his Jewish friends by the Nazis. He said he could not stand with his arms folded and instead joined the resistance. For some months, he worked as a microphotographer and translator. But in August 1942, the leader of his cell was captured and revealed the names of his associates. Beckett's wife went to warn friends, only to find that the Gestapo were already arresting them. Thinking fast, she said she had come for her cat. They were skeptical and followed her to her apartment. There they saw Beckett's books, many of them in German, including a copy of Hitler's Mein Kampf. Deceived or half deceived, they allowed her to go. Suzanne joined Beckett, who was in hiding, and together they hiked southwards towards unoccupied France. They travelled by night for three weeks and finally managed to crawl over the line near Vichy. On they walked towards relatives of Suzanne near Avignon. For the three remaining years of the war, they hid out in the incongruously charming village of Roussillon, with barely enough to eat and in considerable fear. Here they waited for war to end. Beckett continued his resistance activities. He refuses to discuss them, dismissing the matter as Boy Scout stuff. But General de Gaulle put a different value upon them when after the war he conferred the Croix de Guerre on Beckett. One small element of his life in Roussillon would later be recalled in En Attendant Godot where the Bonali brothers, from whom he used to buy a litre of wine, make an unexpected appearance. In 1943, the Beckets moved to a house on the outskirts of Roussillon. In between tedium and terror, Beckett began his second novel, What? It was written, he says, as an exercise to keep my hand in. What is sometimes baffling sometimes ludicrous, and soon moves as if to avoid the distortions of intelligibility to a lunatic asylum. Further peculiarities of this soul landscape were the temperature was warm. Beneath what the waste rose and fell, all was silent. Above what the sky fell and rose, what was rooted to the spot. And sometimes Watt understood all, and sometimes he understood much, and sometimes he understood little, and sometimes he understood nothing, as now. Brunnen vor dem Tore, da steht ein Lindenbaum. Ich träumt in seinem Schatten so manchen süßen Traum. And 
of myself all my life, I think I had been going to my mother with the purpose of establishing our relations on a less precarious footing. And when I was with her, and I often succeeded, I left her without having done anything. And when I was no longer with her, I was again on my way to her, hoping to do better the next time. And when I appeared to give up and to busy myself with something else or with nothing at all anymore, in reality, I was hatching my plans and seeking the way to her house. When the war was at last over, Beckett could again visit his mother, now living at New Place, Fox Rock. She was suffering from Parkinson's disease, which in 1950 would cause her death. He renewed his relationship with his brother Frank, who had taken over the family business. Beckett remained with his mother for six weeks, caring for her and reading to her, with feelings of mounting distress. It was as if the general misfortunes of wartime had found a local focus in her difficult breathing. This sight and all that he had lived through in France now converged in Beckett's mind. Walking along the rock-bordered Dunleary Pier, something happened to him for which he would later never find a word, but he said a little apologetically that it was a revelation. The course of his literary life suddenly opened before him. Where others had sought enrichment, he would seek impoverishment. It was like resolving to go naked. He would give a voice to the enfeebled, the debilitated, the moribund, all those poor creatures who had been beneath or apart from the notice of most writers before him. Of course he had sensed their importance earlier and had been feeling his way towards them, but now he experienced a full realization. When he would write of this magical moment long afterwards, he could do it only through irony. The banana-eating crap in Crap's last tape plays back a bit of the identical experience and hastily switches it off to listen to a quite different one. Beckett did not exempt himself from satire. Spiritually, a year of profound gloom and indigence until that memorable night in March at the end of the jetty in the howling wind never to be forgotten when suddenly I saw the whole thing, the vision at last. This, I fancy, is what I have chiefly to record this evening against the day when my work will be done and perhaps no place left in my memory, warm or cold, for the miracle that for the fire that set it alight. What I suddenly saw then was this, that the belief I had been going on all my life, namely... Great granite rocks, the foam flying up in the light of the lighthouse and the wind gauge spinning like a propeller, clear to me at last that the dark I have always struggled to keep under is in reality my most... Thank <laughs> you. 
Unshatterable association until my dissolution of storm and night with the light of the understanding and the fire. <coughs> my face in her breasts and my hand on her. We lay there without moving, but under us all moved and moved us gently up and down and from side to side. Past midnight, never knew such silence. The earth might be uninhabited. The revelation, nevertheless, enabled him to begin work on what we now know as his famous trilogy, Malloy, Malone Dies, and The Unnameable. Although he began the work at New Place Fox Rock, it was in Paris, in his apartment at Rue de Favorite, he would write for the next six years from 1946 to 1952. Not ever before or after would he experience so impassioned a creative period. As if to signalize the new epoch in his life, he began to write in French. The discovery of a new subject warranted a new language. Though he found the change difficult, it gave him a sense of exaltation, even as he described creatures at their last gasp or near it. The trilogy is a kind of summa of Beckett's point of view. Here, the everyday world is thoroughly discredited. Beckett's wife hawked the manuscript from publisher to publisher. Unfortunately, no one wanted to publish this extraordinary creation. Her husband, accustomed to obscurity, showed no surprise or resentment. But one day, in November 1951, Jérôme Landon, whose publishing house was Les Editions de Minuit, summoned Suzanne to his office. Landon had the courage and confidence to see, for all the unsavoriness of Beckett's subject, that here was a great talent. He has published Beckett ever since. and I don't make a balls of it. And it seemed to me all the more important to get out of this forest with all possible speed, as I would very soon be powerless to get out of anything whatsoever, were it but a bower. Flat on my belly, using my crutches like grapnels, I plunged them ahead of me into the undergrowth, and when I felt they had a hold, I pulled myself forward with an effort of the wrists, for my wrists were still quite strong, fortunately, in spite of my decrepitude, though all swollen and racked by a kind of chronic arthritis, probably. That then, briefly, is how I went about it. But there was always present to my mind, which was still working, if laboriously, the need to turn, to keep on turning, and every three or four jerks I altered course, which permitted me to describe, if not a circle, at least a great polygon. Perfection is not of this world, and to hope that I was going forward in a straight line in spite of everything, day and night, towards my mother. And true enough, the day came when the forest ended and I saw the light. 
the light of the plane, exactly as I had foreseen. I longed to go back into the forest. Oh, not a real longing. Malloy could stay where he happened to be. If Malloy says, my waking was a kind of sleeping, Malone declares, I have lived in a kind of coma. He slips into telling stories in a quest for an identity that eludes him. But let us leave these morbid matters and get on with that of my demise in two or three days, if I remember rightly. Then it will be all over with the Murphys, Merciers, Malloys, Morans and Malones, unless it goes on beyond the grave. I shall not watch myself die. That would spoil everything. Have I watched myself live? Have I ever complained? <laughs> and why rejoice now? I am content, necessarily, but not to the point of clapping my hands. I am satisfied. There, I have enough. I am repaid. I need nothing more. Let me say before I go any further that I forgive nobody. I wish them all an atrocious life, and then the fires and ice of hell, and in the execrable generations to come, an honored name. In the final volume, the unnameable says, let us go on as if I were the only one in the world, whereas I'm the only one absent from it. All these Murphys, Malloys, and Malones do not fool me. They have made me waste my time, suffer for nothing, speak of them when, in order to stop speaking, I should have spoken of me and of me alone. Perhaps it's a dream, all a dream. That would surprise me. I'll wait in the silence. Never sleep again. To the eye, a dream, dream again, dream of the silence, a dream silence, full of murmurs. I don't know. That's all words. Never wake. They're going to fail me. I know that well. They're going to abandon me. You must go on. That's all I know. To be the silence for a moment, a good few moments, or it'll be mine, the lasting one that didn't last, that still lasts. I, it will be I. You must go on. I can't go on. You must go on. I can't go on. I'll go on. The trilogy had taken Beckett into a more and more profound darkness. He was not bogged down, he said. He was fogged down. He needed a respite, and between the second and third books, he undertook an enterprise of a quite different kind. On a road going nowhere, he said, he looked for a measurable, habitable place in the light. He found it on the stage. The name of his play was waiting for Godot. No one could have anticipated the impact of this work. Estragon, let's go. Vladimir, we can't. Estragon, why not? Vladimir, we're waiting for Godot. Estragon, ah. Beckett had no dramatic experience when he wrote Waiting for Godot. He wrote the play in a school notebook. Among his manuscripts, he has held on to this one. The play came to him in a rush. It was written in less than four months and with scarcely any corrections. He began it on the 9th of October 1948, finished it four months later on the 29th of January 1949. Beckett wrote on each right-hand page through to the very end. 
then wrote on the left-hand page all the way back. It was first produced at the Théâtre de Babylone in Paris on January the 6th, 1952, and ran for more than 300 performances. Waiting for Godot begins on a stage that is bare except for a tree. The light is subdued. Two clownish down-and-outers, Vladimir and Estragon, are waiting for Godot. Who Godot is, is not explained, nor why they wait for him. Along come Pozzo and Lucky, one an enslaver and the other his slave. They might be an emblem of inhumanity, though their antics are comical. Vladimir and Estragon are also absurd, though their dilemmas are grave enough. Instead of crumbling away, they persist with heroic ignobility in their waiting. Pozzo and Lucky for some reason return. This time, Pozzo has much to say. Have you not done tormenting me with your accursed time? It's abominable. When? When? One day, is that not enough for you? One day like any other day? One day he went dumb, one day I went blind, one day we'll go deaf, one day we were born, one day we shall die. The same day, the same second, is that not enough for you? They give birth a stride of a grave. The light gleams an instant, then it's night once more. My feet. Moments later, Vladimir, looking on at the sleeping Estragon, sums up the whole human enterprise. Help me. Was I sleeping? while the others suffered? Am I sleeping now? Tomorrow, when I wake, I think I do. What shall I say of today? That with Estragon, my friend, at this place until the fall of night, I waited for Gatto? That Pozzo passed with his carrier and that he spoke to us? Probably. But in all that, what truth will there be? He'll know nothing. He'll tell me about the blows he received, and I'll give him a carrot. A stride of a grave and a difficult birth. Down in the hole, lingeringly, the grave digger puts on the forceps. We have time to grow old. The air is full of our cries. But habit is a great deadener. At me too, someone is looking. Of me too, someone is saying, he is sleeping. He knows nothing. Let him sleep on. I can't go on. What have I said? Waiting for Godot was the turning point for Samuel Beckett. It was the point at which his public found him, and he found his public. His face became almost as famous as his characteristic images. Tramps, boots, hats dustbins, trees. A Beckett landscape became as recognizable as a Dickensian scene. With this play, 
Beckett produced an upheaval in modern drama. Society plays and problem plays were made equally out of date. There was now a strange new school of playwriting in which a heavy emptiness weighed on the characters and yet a weird humour pervaded them as well. Though Beckett helped in the production of his plays, he sought and kept his privacy. Asked what he meant, he replied that he meant what he said. He never attended the first night, and no interviews or press conferences were granted. In 1956, Beckett wrote to a friend, Success and failure on the public level never mattered much to me. In fact, I feel much more at home with the latter, having breathed deep of its vivifying air all my writing life, up to the last two years. For a man who has never wanted for friends, Beckett has chosen as his subjects people in the last ditch, usually alone or dubiously companioned. We're of one mind, all of one mind, always were, deep down. We're fond of one another, we're sorry for one another, but there it is. There's nothing we can do for one another. Finished. It's finished. Nearly finished. It must be nearly finished. Says Clough at the start of Endgame, Beckett's second published play. It contains four characters. Two of them, Nag and Nell, being legless, are kept upright by the dustbins in which they live. The central character, Ham, is a hopeless invalid, crippled and blind, badly attended by a badly treated servant, Clov. Disaster has struck the world outside, and apart from these four characters, confined to one room, there is no other apparent existence. The material sounds hardly auspicious for a play or anything else, yet misery pushed to such an extreme, becomes almost funny. There is a certain grim pleasure in stating the worst perfectly. Faced with the unbearable, human beings preposterously find a phrase for it. I say to myself sometimes, you must learn to suffer better than that. If you want them to weary of punishing you one day, I say to myself sometimes, you must be there, better than that, if you want them to let you go one day. For I feel too old and too far to form new habits. Good. It will never end. I'll never go. Then one day, suddenly it ends, it changes. I don't understand. It dies or it's me. I don't understand that either. I ask the words that remain, sleeping, waking, morning, evening. They have nothing to say. I open the door of the cell and go. I'm so bowed I only see my feet if I open my eyes. And between my legs, a little trail of black. I say to myself that the earth is extinguished, though I never saw it lit. It's easy going. When I fall, I'll weep for happiness. While Beckett's plays invariably represent their characters in blind alleys, they are not always coloured so dark a shade of black as end game. It might seem that to be buried in sand would be worse than living in a dustbin, but Winnie, the ebullient wife in happy days, seems mindlessly content as the sand climbs up her torso. 
After all, she has her bag with her and can rifle in that as she chatters cheerily on to her decrepit husband. Let you sleep on. Oh, yes. If only I could bear to be alone. I mean, prattle away with not a soul to hear. Not that I flatter myself you hear much. No, Willie, God forbid. Days, perhaps, and you hear nothing. But days, too, when you answer. So that I may say at all times, even when you do not answer and perhaps hear nothing, something of this is being heard. I am not merely talking to myself, that is, in the wilderness, a thing I could never bear to do for any length of time. Well, that is what enables me to go on. Or go on talking, that is. Whereas if you were to die, the old style, or go away and leave me, then what would I do? What could I do? All day long, I mean between the bell for waking and the bell for sleep, simply gaze before me with compressed lips. Not another word as long as I drew breath. Nothing to break the silence of this place. Save possibly now and then, every now and then, a sigh into my looking glass. For a brief gale of laughter, should I happen to hear the old joke again? In 1969, Samuel Beckett was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. In its citation, the Swedish Academy said that Mr. Beckett was being honored for his writing, which in new forms for the novel and drama, acquires its elevation from the destitution of modern man. Beckett has not been willing to say whether this is true or not. My work, he has said, is a matter of fundamental sounds, no joke intended, made as fully as possible, and I accept responsibility for nothing else. For a man who has spent his life celebrating in literature the futility of existence and the joyous hope for the peace of death, his writing shows surprisingly little sign of running down. Beckett's work goes on undiminished, with language and humour pitted against grief and silence. I love the word. Words have been my only loves, not many. In his later works, Beckett seems to strive towards a narrower and narrower compass, a plainer diction, a bigger role for silence. Limbless, eyeless, or whatever elseless, his characters have feelings and wonderful words to express them ludicrous and pathetic. They are proof that the residue of the human is still human. Deviser of the voice and of its hearer and of himself. Deviser of himself for company. Leave it at that.
nothing stirring, faintly stirring. Thirty thousand nights of ghosts beyond, beyond that black beyond. Ghost light, ghost nights, ghost rooms, ghost graves, ghosts. He all but said, ghost loved ones. The dead and gone, the dying and the going. From the word go, the word be gone. Such as the light going now. Beckett is almost alone among writers in his obsession with the seventh of the seven ages of man. As energy fails, language is put to the severest test. The less there is to say, the better it is said. It is sumptuous minimalism. As hope expires of her ever reappearing, she reappears. At first sight, little changed. It is evening. It will always be evening. When not night, she emerges at the fringe of the pastures and sets forward across them, slowly, with fluttering step, as if wanting mass, suddenly still, and as suddenly on her way again. At this rate, it will be black night before she reaches home. Home. At the same instant, night. When not evening, night. But time slows all this while, suits its speed to hers. Whence, from beginning to end of her course, no loss, or but little of twilight, a matter at most of a candle or two. Bearing south as best she can, she casts toward the moon to come her long black shadow. They come at last to the door, holding a great key. Head bowed, she stands exposed, facing east. All dead still. All, save hanging from a finger, the old key polished by youth. Trembling, it faintly shimmers in the light of the moon. As the mind reaches the end of its tether, there is yet a verbal persistence. The man and child who walk may or may not be real. On they go, or perhaps do not go. But the force that animates and pictures them, though it takes back all that it offers, is somehow sacred and undefeated. Bit by bit, an old man and child, in the dim void, bit by bit, an old man and child, any other would do as ill, hand in hand with equal plod they go, in the free hands, no, free empty hands, backs turned, both bowed, with equal plod they go. Slowly, with never a pause, plod on and never recede. No how less, no how worse, no how naught, no 
好。